Guys, let's wait for a couple more minutes. A lot of new people are logging in. Good morning, Deb. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good. It's nice to be here. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah. So I think we can get started off. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Deb, are you able to see my screen? Yes, it's right there. Okay. Guys, uh, everybody, thanks a lot for logging in today. I'd like to start off with some great news. We've got over 800 registrations for this webinar, and that's a new record for us. So we really appreciate you logging in on a Wednesday and joining us. Uh, diving in right into the meeting. Uh, in this webinar, we'll speak about how the best sales reps engage with their prospects especially around how they converse with them and win deals. Uh, we'll share tips and tricks on how you can make the most out of every conversation and how to avoid pitfalls that might potentially kill off a deal. For this, we're teaming up with one of the best sales coaches out there. Deb comes with over 30 years of experience in sales, and she's also a top 30 sales guru around the world. Now, she's won a lot of awards, and among one of them is that she's one of the most influential businesswomen out there. She's also an author. She's written a couple of books on sales that are referred to by industry leaders. She's also the founder of Sales Expert Channel, where she gives keynotes and presentations and also actively engages in sales coaching. For this webinar in particular, she leveraged her experience of analyzing over 10,000 sales calls. So you can rest assured that the insights that we learn from this is one effective, practical, and, and actually done before. Uh, so before I hand over the mic to her, I'd just like to go through the agenda very quick. So the very first thing is we have a brief on VTiger. Uh, this mm -hmm. is for the people who are new here. After that, I'll hand over the mic to Deb. She'll cover the seven deadly sins in sales conversations in detail. And then we have a very engaging section where we play out a real life scenario to showcase where sales reps uh, falter and you know, how we can actually improve that situation. Uh, and for continued reading on this topic, we're also going to give you a chapter of, uh, of Deb's book, Discover Questions. So that's going to be a good learning experience for you and the takeaway. And right through the end, we also have a giveaway that's worth $1,000. So you know, five lucky winners will get their hands on this. And if you're interested in knowing how you can get your hands on this, stay tuned. And then we'll have a Q&A session where we field questions from you and hopefully answer all of them. Uh, so for, for people who are new here, I thought I'll just take a minute to speak about VTiger and why we're actually teaming up with Deb to do this webinar. Uh, VTiger has been adding value to the sales community since 2004, and that's when it was founded. And you know, back in the day, we launched an open source CRM, and that went on to become very successful. So we've got about 5 million downloads. And at the moment, we're the number one you know, open source CRM in the world. And a few years ago, with the cloud revolution coming in, we thought we'll be able to add more value to our customers by switching to the cloud model. And we did that in 2010. And as of now, uh, we've had three offices around the globe and uh, over 300,000 happy customers. Uh, and at the same time, we've been awarded uh, by, by Gartner, G2 Cloud, GetApp, and a bunch of other uh, publications, mainly because of our excellence in product and service. And the latest award that we won is by G2 Cloud, where we are the number one leader in the all-in-one CRM category. So I just thought I'd take a minute to speak about this. And I think now, Deb, I'm handing over the call to you for you to take the webinar. OK. Uh, thanks, Shiva. I am really honored to be here with all of you. I want to give you just a little bit more background so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, one of the things that I do is I spend a lot of time in field with salespeople. I go on ride-alongs on their sales calls, and I listen to recorded calls and, and review emails. And because I'm a neutral observer looking in, I can often spot things that the salesperson might not recognize for themselves. See, most sellers, they, they think that they're not committing any sins when it comes to sales conversations until they hear one played back to them or until they hear the response from a buyer that I've interviewed after a sales call. The reason for these seven sins that we're about to cover is simply this. It's that sellers, when, when we're selling, we're, we're pulled in two different directions. One direction, we're pulled to serve the buyer and to pay attention to the buyer and to think like the buyer. 
but we're also pulled in this other direction to make the sale. And it's easy for this to get out of balance, of course, because making the sale is, is how we get paid. It's how we get measured. It's what our sales manager is talking about to us. It's, it's where the pressure comes from. But when that does get out of balance, the quality of sales conversations suffers. So today I just wanted to put this into very extreme terms. We're calling this the seven deadly sins and then giving you some examples today. The purpose of this is it's just meant to help you recognize when this is occurring. And then that way you can self-correct. For sales managers, for those of you who are listening, my hope is that you're going to see some places where your coaching and your feedback could be helpful to the sales team as they are potentially making mistakes like this. And as Shiva said, this is from research. There uh, is buyer research at the foundation of, of both my books, Discover Questions, Get You Connected, as well as in Stop Selling and Start Leading. But what we're focusing on today primarily comes from the research behind Discover Questions, which spanned over 20 years and over 10,000 sales calls, as well as buyers uh, interviews following those sales calls. So with that, let's go ahead and get started on the first deadly sin in sales conversations, and that is pride. Now, what I mean by pride, what this looks like when it's happening, is that you you think you already know the answers. You're making some assumptions. You're not allowing for there to be a good two-way dialogue between you and your buyer. And this is really important. Let me just fold in something here that does come from the more recent Stop Selling and Start Leading research with 530 B2B buyers. We asked them to rank order 30 desirable behaviors that they want to see more often from sellers. And number one on that list, the number one thing that buyers want to see more often from sellers is for this opportunity for there to be a two-way dialogue where the seller is hearing the buyer questions, responding to the buyer's questions, anticipating their questions, and not just running on endlessly because they assume they know what the buyer needs to hear. So pride is a big factor at least according to buyers. And the very best way to fix this one is to have the, well, the humility to, to pause and to remember that we don't know everything and that there are some things we could learn about a buyer and that we want to have a two-way dialogue instead of a one-way pitch. Having that kind of humility means that you're going to ask quality questions really good questions that will engage the buyer, um, might make them think, and, and will create value. If you're conducting some needs analysis or you're going through your qualifying process, that's where this is most important at all. Buyers, they've gotten really impatient, maybe even almost intolerant of a one-way needs assessment process. They don't want that diagnostic approach. They prefer what I call a, a logic needs assessment instead of a diagnostic one that sounds like a survey. So for that reason, to eliminate pride, ask questions, even if you think you know the answer. And when buyers ask you a question, be sure to answer that right away. Don't make any assumptions. Be really open to the dialogue. Let the buyer do more of the talking. And oh, also, don't, uh, don't pounce at the first hint of a need. Right, you, you want to uh, give them plenty of time uh, to be able to fully elaborate on that need and to make sure that you understand it all the way. Now at the end, uh, I'm just gonna present these in rapid order, but at the end, we're gonna do a little bit of role play with some of these. So stay tuned if you wanna know how pride sounds when it shows up in a sales call and how you could fix it. We'll, we'll make sure to do a demo of that one. Okay, the next uh, deadly sin of sales conversations is envy. And you might be surprised, but this happens because buyers do have more of the power, an imbalance of the power in the buyer-seller relationship. And sometimes sellers are, well, they're, they're envious of that buyer's power. If you were to look in the dictionary, envy is defined as um, any feeling of 
of uh, discontent or any covetousness with regard to somebody else's advantages or somebody else's success or possessions or power. So as sellers, because we're envious of the buyer's power, we respond sometimes by exhibiting bad behaviors. And these come through in our conversations. They, they look like we're so envious that we're trying to seize control. We're trying to take back that power. We don't, we don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want it to look like we're in that weaker position. But actually, it's those envious actions that end up weakening us the very most. So how do you fix this? Well, I think first of all, you have to acknowledge that buyers do have more power. They have access to more information. They have options that they never had before. So we just have to understand that. And when we enter into the relationship, instead of trying to hastily take that from them, we could sort of dignify it. We could seek first to understand where they're coming from, and what they want and how we can help them. We could seek first to be understood, uh, to understand them, and then to be understood for what we could offer them. If we start out by being contentious or by putting the buyer on the defensive, then we lose. And I'll give you an example of where this really frequently happens. I get at least one email a day where somebody says to me, Hey, Deb, I took a look at your website and, well, it's got some problems. I could fix those problems for you. But they haven't tried to understand me at all yet. Instead, they tried to give me a, a negative feeling so that they could then leverage that to have some power back in that relationship. And, and it doesn't work. There's no collaboration. They haven't tried to draw me into the conversation. So I just ignore those. They go straight to spam. So the real control, just remember the real control goes to the person who wants to understand. And a great way to understand is by asking quality questions. That's really the very best way I know to balance any inequality in power. There's no need to attack people, no need to offend people. Just work to understand the buyer first. We're going through these pretty quick. So number three, the third sin when it comes to sales conversations, the third deadly sin is gluttony. Uh, here's a dramatic term. Um, gluttony, actually, it's an old-fashioned word. What it really means is being excessive or being voracious in our appetites. And where this kind of shows up is when we come on so strong that we end up looking disrespectful in our sales conversations. Bad behaviors that emanate from, from this kind of a sin, they range from, oh, talking too much and, and taking too much of the buyer's time with low value questions and idle chit chat and other sorts of things to, to try to, to warm up the buyer, but we're wasting their time and, and that's how they see it. All the way from that over to being really greedy with add on features and with trying to take too much from the customers that we already have relationships with. We, we get greedy, we get gluttonous because we aren't delivering value back to the customer. It always has to be a balance of taking so that we can be giving an equal measure of value. Or even if we have to tip the scales, let's tip it on the side of the buyer's favor by piling on as much value as we possibly can in every single conversation. You create value just by virtue of asking great questions that cause them to pause, to think, to get some value out of the process that you're taking them through. You can stay aligned with your buyer's process and with their capacity too, if in addition to asking great questions, you're doing a very good job of listening and understanding, maybe even reading between the lines, the things that they haven't said outright, but that they are suggesting uh, through their emotional tone. When you're asking questions, you're using a, a pull strategy. You're pulling something from the buyer instead of a push strategy where you're trying to push something at the buyer. And that is always more effective. If you want to have this pull strategy to draw the buyer in, then you can't lead with greed. 
You don't want to let any short-term possibilities of a sale impair the, the trust that's the foundation of that long-term relationship. Going back to our buyer research, one of the comments that I heard over those 20 years with Discover Questions and heard even more keenly in the recent research for Stop Selling and Start Leading is that something that really matters a lot to the buyer is if they can sense that a seller has their best interest in mind, the buyer's best interest in mind, and, and they look for that. So be careful, don't commit the sin of gluttony, but be sure that you are creating value and that you're giving something to your buyers in every transaction. Number four, the fourth deadly sin of sales conversations is exhibiting wrath. So wrath is when it looks like you um, are coming across as hostile or angry, or if you are indignant in any way. Uh, wrath means that you're responding with a vengeance or in a way that looks like you're going to be punishing others. Now, there are some sales training programs out there where you might have been taught to use questions in a way that is aggressive or in a way that makes you um, come across as being manipulative. Now, there are some misunderstandings. Most sales training doesn't set out to cause you to be manipulative or aggressive, but sometimes it gets interpreted that way. In fact, there's a really, really good body of work known as the challenger sale. But sometimes sellers get a little overzealous with this and they use it incorrectly. So they end up looking very combative to buyers. They ask these questions as if they're in attack mode and that causes buyers to become really defensive. The way that you fix this, well, don't stop asking questions, but ask them in a way that is respectful. Ask them at a time when you've built up the trust and the relationship is strong. Don't start with a question that is so provocative that it causes the buyer to back up and, and to view you as someone they, they fear or who is trying to do something to them. Ask your questions in a way that it, it's not meant to trap somebody, it's meant to open up somebody to facilitate that understanding. Right? This is about your general intention to help your buyers. And when you have that true intention, it's gonna change the quality of your questions and the way that you ask them. All right, we need to keep on moving forward here. The next sin is greed. This sin, when it happens, it comes across as not sharing. It's a little bit like gluttony, but this more often happens when we are hoarding information. For example, if, uh, if the buyer asks you about price, maybe they ask you before you've really established value and you're not ready to share the price, but if you withhold it, it looks like you are hoarding that information. Another time this shows up is after we've already secured a deal and suddenly as sellers, we're less available. We don't take that buyer's call as readily. We don't respond as quickly. Without meaning to, we make that customer feel unimportant to us. So in order to avoid this sin in sales conversations, we have to remember that every single touch point matters. We're trying to create memorable, high value customer experiences. And the truth is, the stereotype about sellers that we're already up against, that stereotype is that we're greedy, we're money motivated, we have dollar signs in our eyes. So we do have to be proactive to overcome those stereotypes and, and to never prove them right. Our buyers expect us to be greedy. We have to prove them wrong. We can't take them for granted. So whenever possible, to avoid this sin, you just need to orient yourself toward the buyer and make sure that you're continuing to meet their needs. I think we have two more. The next deadly sin in sales conversations is going to be sloth. And what sloth looks like when it happens, it means that you're uh, being lazy. You're taking shortcuts. You're 
putting in a limited effort instead of challenging yourself. Inside the sales conversation, that will show up in a lot of places. It might show up if you didn't invest any time in pre-call planning so you could learn a little bit about this prospect or person that you're meeting with. Um, it might show up if you're meeting with an established customer, but you didn't take a look back at, at the activity they've had with your organization in the past. Um, maybe it shows up in your, in your CRM because you're not making enough calls, you're not putting enough into your pipeline, you're not following through in a timely manner, or you're not uh, conducting a really quality discovery call, and you don't have enough information that you're able to put in there, which means that the output, your, your proposal, won't be as compelling. Here's the way you fix that. It's, it's simple. You just take those extra steps. And in terms of time management, I have a tip for you. This is, this is Deb's number one rule in selling because we don't have an opportunity to give all that time to every single person that we ever encounter. So we have to rely on a simple formula. My formula is E equals O. And that simply means that the amount of effort you sh should put in is equivalent to the size of the opportunity. And of course that means, well, they have to determine the size of the opportunity before you know how much effort to put in there. So don't make assumptions. Make sure that you first uh, check it out to see if the opportunity's there. And then you'll know when to, to cut corners and who to cut them with. So Shiva, I think that we might have, I think I saw a slide jump past us. I think we might have missed the one that, that's lust. Did we miss that one? There, there it is. Okay. And this just means putting your needs before everything else. One of the dictionary definitions of lust is ardent enthusiasm, unrestrained zest, or an uncontrolled craving or desire. That's a natural progression out of greed or gluttony. And it happens when you want the sale so, so badly that you forget that there's another person involved, that we need to have this human-to-human -human interaction and think about the needs of the buyer, too. And that'll happen if you really do tune into your buyer's perspective. If you think about this as H2H or human-to-human, -human, if you're not salacious in the way that you pursue your buyers, if you're not trying to make them feel like objects just so you can score the quick sale, being oriented to them, looking out for the subtle cues, that's what will help you to, to be a person before you try to be a salesperson. And it's what will keep you from coming across in a way that's offensive to your buyer. Okay, so those, that's the quick rundown of the seven deadly sins in sales conversations. Let's have some fun with these now. Well, thanks a lot for that, Deb. Uh, yeah, I think I think before we do the real life scenarios, I'll just talk about uh, you know how our audience can actually get started with improving their conversation. Uh, so, so guys, I think one of the simplest things to do is record the conversations that you have with your prospects, uh, and you know you can play it back at a later time. And when you when you play it back, that's when you really understand uh, the areas where you could improve. At the same time, you know I I, I was a sales rep before this. And what I used to do was I used to have my manager uh, take a look at these recordings and ask them to give me feedback uh, because they're much more experienced. So usually, you know, if you have more than five or 10 conversations every day, it gets really hard to record these conversations and actually organize them. So I think that's where uh, a CRM comes into play. Now, uh, a lot of CRMs are out there which record uh, conversations and VTiger stands out among that. So we usually automatically log and record every sales conversation out there. And you know you can actually take down notes and all of this is actually stored for access in the future. And the best part is that every conversation is linked to a contact record. So you know if you or your manager were to really evaluate your conversation, that will build a lot more context. Uh, in addition to that, VTiger also integrates with, uh, with a bunch of telephony services. With these integrations, you can you can strike a conversation right from your CRM. You can convert incoming calls into a lead or an opportunity. And the best part is all of this is recorded, so you can always go back and and you know analyze where you've gone wrong and use uh, the, the insights that Deb had shared uh, to, to to better to be, to improve your conversations. I think uh, at the moment now, uh, Deb, yeah, we can probably go back to the uh, the real life scenarios, uh, and I think I'll put on my buyer hat. 
and and Dev's gonna be the seller for this one. Yeah, we're just gonna do a little role play. And remember to stick around. Uh, I hope that you'll download the free chapter from Discover Questions. That book does talk about many of the things we're discussing here. And don't forget, at the end of our time together, we do have a really, really cool giveaway. Uh, you have a chance to be the very first people to ever try out a new product that's, I think, um, something you're really going to like. So, okay, here we go. We're going to, uh, I'll be the, the seller. She was going to be my buyer. We're going to demonstrate first a little scenario, all from real sales coaching that I've done. None of these are made up. But um, we're going to demonstrate one first that has to do with pride. And we won't have a chance, I don't think, to get through all seven. So if there's something you really want to see a demo of, go ahead and chat that in. We'll try to monitor those and, and skip ahead to the ones that you want to see most. So, pride. Here we go. This is what it looks like. Remember, this is when you think you already know the answers and you're making some assumptions instead of allowing for good two-way dialogue. I'll give you a bad example and then we'll come back and, and give you an example of, of a fix. So. Here we go. I've got my, uh, my phone on. I'm calling Shiva. And he answered the phone and I say, hi, Shiva. Hey, thank you very much for your interest in our CRM product. I know you have lots of followers, so you're going to love our enterprise solution. Oh, and, and the monthly email uh, usage enhancement that we offer that will make it more affordable for you to send out your campaigns and your newsletters. Oh, and, and let me tell you, uh, and he interrupts me because I'm going on and on. Okay, Dev, hold on a minute. Uh, I'm not really interested in buying a CRM for our email and marketing capabilities. That's not what you're looking for. Oh, now as a seller, all my unrestrained enthusiasm took me down a wrong path. That was my pride. That was my assumption that I knew what this buyer wanted. And I was way off base. And when that happens, it's, it's pretty hard to recover from it. Uh, the buyer's offended, and they feel like I've wasted their time. That was low value. So it's going to be very hard for me to, to recoup. Of course, the one question that could save me here is if I said, oh, I, I apologize, what was it that interested you? Maybe he'd give me a second chance here. But here's a much more elegant way to handle this. Let me give you a different kind of a conversation, one that keeps you from committing the sin of, of pride. It would go something like this. Hi, Shiva. Thank you for your interest in our CRM product. What initially prompted your interest in our product? Thanks a lot for the call. We are a startup and we're looking at a CRM that gives competitive pricing. And I see that yours did. Can you send across a quote for about 10 sales reps? Oh, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, before I do that, let me just check out a few details. I, I want to make sure I give you an accurate quote. Um, is price the most important criteria for you? in determining which CRM you'll select? Well, we are quite constrained because we're a small company, but usually, you know, we're looking at a CRM that's easy to use and uh, with a good support structure that will help our sales reps get onboarded on it easily. The last thing we want is to invest in a tool that's just not being used. I see, of course. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I've seen people go down that road. We, we don't want that to happen. What other benefits do you want for your business once your team is using a CRM? And we would go on from there. Now, with just a couple of questions and a few moments, I will have gathered a lot of information. I'll come back to price before I go too long because buyers want us to not hoard this information, but to give it to them when they ask for it. But uh, what I will have done is gather the information so that I can put together the right proposal and I can quote the right price, and I can understand where my new buyer is, is wanting to take their business. So that gives me an opportunity to be an asset to them long-term too, perhaps to, to grow our business with them as we help them to grow their business. Yep. But I have to set aside pride to do any of that. Thanks a lot for the deduction of the situation. I think, I think you know, with this real scenarios. scenario, our audience is going to get a much clearer picture of what each of these sins and how do they percolate to all the conversations. So do you want to jump over to the next one, Deb? Sure. Do we have anybody asking for a particular one or, or shall we pick? Uh, I think we can pick it up because I have no clue how to go to the chat window right now. It's quite complicated. Oh, okay. 
Um, so I'll, uh, I'll take a look there as we're going. It doesn't look anybody's chimed in yet, but let's go straight ahead and go into, let's go into Envy, because I think that one is sometimes puzzling to the sellers that I work with. So remember, this is because you have this feeling of, of a power imbalance. And if you've been selling as long as I have, it didn't used to be this way. Before the age of the internet, sellers had all the information and that gave them a lot more power than they currently have. But bad behaviors sometimes come out because of our desire to have that power. Let me give you an example first of, of how it comes out and then we'll correct for it. So here we go again, I'll, I'll be on the phone, I suppose, uh, once more, and it would go something like this. Um, hello, Shiva, uh, look, I, I know you're busy, so I'll get right to the point. Hey, you know, your current CRM, the one you're using, it's bloated with features you don't even use, and it's expensive. You're wasting a lot of money. You're paying for name recognition with those big guys, and that helps them more than it helps you. You ought to be taking a look at our CRM. It's designed with you in mind. Hold on. How do you know me? How do you get my number? Of course. Right? We can't make assumptions. We already talked about that with pride. And leading with a tone and with language that's offensive to someone else only causes them to build walls, defensive walls. This is a human on the other end of the phone, not just a prospect, a person. And they're going to respond as people naturally do. So although I might have been right, maybe their CRM is bloated. Maybe it is expensive. Maybe they are just paying for some name recognition. So what? I gain nothing by saying that out of my, my desire to, to take control back in the relationship. Here's where we're going to seek first to understand and then to be understood. So let's rewind. Let's see if we can do this a little bit better. Ready, Shiva? Yes, I am. All right. So... Hello, Shiva. I'm calling because so many small and mid-sized businesses like yours are migrating to CRMs that are built with their needs in mind. Their number one frustration is that they can't seem to get support from the big name providers they currently work with. What's your experience been like with your provider? Well, it's been a little tough, especially when you have issues because we are a small company and I don't think they're a priority for a large CRM provider. So I think a lot of companies, especially SMBs, are facing this issue when they go with enterprise solutions. But how can you help me, Dev? Oh, well, I, thank you for sharing that with me. I, I've heard this before. You're not alone. Well, if you really did understand those features in your CRM and you were able to get that tech support and have easier access to training and support, what would that mean to you? How would that help you? Well, I think, first of all, a lot of my sales reps would be active on the CRM. At the moment, none of them actually, hardly any of them really put all the information. I think if they do put in the information, I'll be able to forecast better and monitor my pipeline and plan for the, for, for the next quarter or the next month. So I think these are the benefits that would come with a much more friendlier service provider. Okay. Thank you. I really appreciate that you're sharing this with me. And um, I think that there might be some things I can do to help you. But one more question first. What are the thoughts about the cost of your current CRM? relative to the value that you're getting from it? Uh, I think it's a little expensive and I'm, I'm not really looking forward to the time where I have to cut a check for them. So yes, I think it's, they're probably ripping me off right now. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to tell you that every single sales call will go this smoothly, but you might be surprised. They, they will, buyers will share information with you when you ask thought-provoking questions when you seek first to understand, when you don't make assumptions, and when you don't make power grabs. So that's what we're really after here. Okay, let's see here. Um, somebody here would like to see a role play for Envy. That's the one that we just did. Somebody wants to see one for less. So let's see, we might only fit in one or two more. Let's jump over to that one. Okay. Keep giving us your chat messages. I know somebody else wants sloth. So we'll do lust and sloth as time allows. Okay, Shiva? Sure, sounds good. Okay, so uh, just a reminder. Lust means putting your needs before everything else. And it's about forgetting that that's another person that you're talking to and that they have needs too. So a bad example might sound something like this. I might um, say to Shiva, hey, uh, Shiva, hi, it's Deb. Look, we really need to get this contract signed today. We need to get you set up on the CRM. I know, I know you've been out of the office on, on some personal business, but I'm, I'm glad you're back because I'm, I'm on a deadline here. 
C- could you get this back to me by noon, please? Deb, I'm really sorry. I just came back from a long uh, break and I have a lot of other high priority tasks to look, look into. I'm sorry, I don't think I'll be able to do it today. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, okay, look, I'm just trying to get this deal done because you said you said you wanted it. Uh, you know, we have quotas here, so I was really hoping you'd help me out since we've been talking about this now for over a month. Is there any way you can fit this in? Deb, I'm really sorry, I don't think I'll be able to do it today. I'll speak to you later, bye. Okay. Yeah, you can't wait to get away from me now. Uh, Human to human. I didn't empathize with his situation. I didn't even ask about his situation. I was salacious. I was pursuing this buyer only with my own needs in mind. I probably made this person feel more like an object who was going to satisfy my own needs. And that's not the way people want to be treated. And I, you might be thinking, I would never, ever do anything like this. And I believe you, you would never intend to come across this way to your buyers. Please remember, though, the examples I'm sharing with you, they all come from real sales calls from good salespeople who also intended to be good to their buyers, but they just got caught up. They got pulled and they got this this imbalance of making the sale versus nurturing the relationship. So let's see if we can do this one a little bit better. Rewind. Here's a, another way that you could handle this situation. You're still on deadline. You still have a quota. Your buyer has still been out on leave, but perhaps there's something we can do a little bit differently. Welcome back, Shiva. I heard that, that you were out on some extended personal leave, and I just wanted to, to pick up where we left off, but, but only, only if you're ready to do so. Hi, Deb. Thanks a lot for calling. Uh, I've had a rough couple of weeks. There's been a death in the family and I wasn't able to attend to a lot of work. So I've just come back and it's great to be focused on something else. Uh, well, I've got a bunch of projects and I'm looking at a proposal actually at the moment. Oh, p- please accept my, my deepest condolences. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, as you're getting back into things, as you're focusing on work again, and there's no pressure here, um, but you said you were looking at that. Uh, where where do things stand with, with that contract that we had been talking about? Uh, it looks pretty good. So I've got all the approvals needed from my seniors. Uh, could you send across the next steps and we can proceed right away? A- a- absolutely. Sure, we could do that. Thank you, Dad. Okay, now the only difference here, and remember, these are real situations. <laughs> so um, the only difference here is a buyer who is oriented to someone else. And it wasn't about it being a sale that had to get made today. It was about meeting the needs of a buyer today. Sounds good. We are right on time. Do we have time to, to do sloth? Yeah, I think I think uh, we can do one more before okay. we go. I think, yeah, okay. we got the giveaway at the end. I think other than that, a Q&A session. So I think we can probably wrap up uh, sloth as soon as possible. Okay. Don't leave. Nobody leave. We've got a really good little offer we want to make for you. Okay. Here's a bad example of sloth. Sloth is all about taking shortcuts. It's about putting less effort into a situation than the opportunity warrants. So um, here's a bad example. Uh, Yeah, hi, thanks for your call. Um, Yes, as it says on the website, our marketing features will be launching soon. Um, Since you have have 60,000 contacts, you could probably expect to spend $246 per month. You can set all of that up online. Okay. All right, uh, Deb, I have, a, I have a question. I actually want to buy a sales CRM as well. Now, if I add on the sales CRM, am I going to get a discount later on? Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's all priced for you online. There's, there's different staging on that. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can kind of see all those prices right there on the web page. Well, Deb, uh, okay, that's not really helpful, but okay, let me, let me rephrase this. What if I add or increase the number of contacts? Because, you know, we're trying to run a campaign and that's going to increase a lot. How is the pricing going to be after that? Yeah, yeah. So the price, you can see right there on the chart, the price, it scales with every 1,000 contacts. And, and you got to go to the pricing tab on the website. Okay, that, yeah. Okay. Now, this, this may all be true. Maybe it's right there on the website. But... I could do a number of different things. I could screen share and show this. I could hear the question and have a, a conversation because some people do a better job of, of hearing their oral learners. They, they hear by listening. They understand by listening instead of by a visual cue. So the needs of this buyer aren't being met by the website. I should not be so lazy as to also not meet the needs of this buyer. So instead, it ought to sound something more like this. 
Instead, we'd say something like, um, yes, th thanks for your call. Uh, you said that you have 60,000 contacts. Uh, what are you projecting for the future? Well, we've got a very aggressive plan this year. We're looking at doubling it. So how does it Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you are you looking for a CRM that scales along with you? Yes, yes, Dad. Okay. A and what about on the sales side? What are you using there to support your sales growth and, and to follow up with those new contacts? At the moment, it's quite ad hoc. We're using Sheets. Uh, but I think I'd like to opt in for a full-fledged CRM uh, in the future, probably in the next quarter itself. Okay. Let's talk about that in total then. All right, so just one or two more questions, really listening as opposing to, to giving someone the website, and it turns out to be a big enough opportunity that it certainly is worth my time. I do want to put more time and effort into a situation like this one and not expect the website to do all the work. Okay, okay so Shiva, what else do we want to do here? I think we can just, yeah, I think we're done with the scenarios. We can probably move on with the rest of the slides. Uh, and guys, coming back, uh, just a refresher. Uh, if you want to get started with, uh, you know, improving your conversation, as I said, the first thing that you want to do is start recording them. Uh, you know, you can try this out uh, with WeTiger. You can go on to the URL that's displayed on on your screens right now. It's a completely free trial for 15 days. We don't even take your credit card. It's completely commitment free. Uh, and you know, if you get onto the trial, uh, one of our sales apps will be in touch with you as well. And they'll speak to you about how you can record your conversations and ultimately become a better salesperson. Now, if you have any questions, I have my email ID displayed on the screen. You can write to me and I'll help you with it. Uh, before we go, I think uh, this is sort of uh, another focus of the webinar where Deb will speak about the giveaway that we have. Uh, Deb, over to you. Okay, and thanks for all the chat comments. I'm reading through those as we go and I appreciate those. We'll take questions in a moment. Okay, for everybody who's listening live to this webinar, we have launched today, but it's a soft launch. This is not available to the public yet, but we have launched an e-learning version of Discover Questions. This book was out in 2013. It was the bronze medal winner that year of a top sales book. It has since been named one of the top 20 most highly rated sales books of all time, according to Amazon and curated rankings. And it um, continues to, to go strong. We've had a training program that's been offered to hundreds of companies across the world, but it's always been in a classroom format, instructor-led, or in some cases, uh, webinar-led with live instruction. But we now are launching the e-learning version, which means that any individual can come in it's self-paced, it's on demand. There are 17 modules. This is a, a pretty robust e-learning program. It's got videos, it's got exercises, you earn a certificate if you complete the program, and nobody in the world has been able to take the e-learning until today. But the first five people who take this program are going to take it from this webinar for free, it's going to be retailing for over $200 uh, each person, but you're going to get a chance to win this at no cost. All I'm going to ask in return is that as one of the earliest users, that you give me a little feedback so we can continue to improve it and make it really strong uh, when we launch it for sale to the rest of the world. We think it's pretty good, but we'd like to invite you, if you are interested in this, to give us your first and last name and your email address, put that into the chat field, if you put your first and last name and your business email address in there, then we will uh, be taking five of those. And later today, you'll receive an email with the website access and the coupon code so that you can get this for free. No strings attached, no hidden costs at all. That's the offer. I hope you like it. Do we have some questions, Shiva, that we want to take now? I think if I was part of the audience, I would have given my email ID and my name for this. But yeah, I think so we'll wait. So guys, this is a Q&A session. Uh, you know, we can, we budgeted about five minutes for this. I think, uh, yeah. So if you guys have any questions, uh, Deb and I will, will, will feel this at the moment. Okay, lots and lots of names and email addresses coming in. Thank you for those. I'm sorting through those to find the questions here. Yeah. Gotta go back a little ways. 
but keep posting and we, we want to make sure to take all of your questions. And by the way, um, I'm happy to take questions if those who listen in later to the recorded version have them just email me or, or uh, I hope everyone live or recorded will also invite me to connect with you on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to take your questions there too. Sure, Deb. I think after the webinar, we'll drop them an email uh, with, you, with, with, with your contact details. And uh, we'll also give them uh, a chapter of your book as an attachment. So that's going to be, yeah, and we'll keep the channels open. If anybody has any questions for either of us, uh, we'll route it out. Okay. So I went back before we started getting names and email addresses. And here's a question about a challenge that customers are, are giving one particular person here. Um, thank you, Bharath, uh, about your question regarding licenses and implementation. They're feeling like the prices are too high. And the question is how to overcome the objection to give the right solution at the right price. And I'll just, I'll give you a very brief answer. I think one thing to do is to ask a question like the one I asked in the role play to ask a question when they bring up that early objection on price to say, please help me understand, is price your number one consideration as you're evaluating your options? People will usually not say yes to that question. They'll say, well, no, we're also looking at, and then you're gonna know what they value, what's most important to them, and you're going to wanna talk about that more than you talk about the price. You're going to want to make a comparison on what they truly value. With that question, you're reminding them that you're not a commodity and this is not just a price alone comparison. They forget that because they get so caught up in, in looking at price, but we have to help them remember that. That's my short answer. I, I hope that will help you. Yeah, I think there's another question that from Scott Vedel, uh, uh, and he asks, how can you be the most successful salesperson without being aggressive? How do you think you should handle it? Well, yeah. So I think there's a difference between being assertive and being aggressive. And that's the distinction that we would want to be sure to make. You definitely have to be assertive to be a successful salesperson. You have to assert everything you can that will meet the buyer's needs. A person who's assertive doesn't let their own needs get trampled on while they're meeting other people's needs. A person who's aggressive only advances their own needs and does trample on the needs of the other person. So that's the difference. And it's a fine line that, that you have to walk. But, but if you are, if, let me put it this way, if you will be aggressive and at the very same time that you're being aggressive, if you'll be open and receptive to the buyer's needs, that'll help you to balance this out. Well, thanks a lot for that, Deb. We've got another good one. And this, I think, happens in a lot of, uh, a lot of, territories where the buyers are not so serious so the question is by Giorgio and he and he asks you know what if the person that you're dealing with the prospect keep wasting your time without really showing any sales results or without sort of you know taking it forward within the company how do you think we should deal with this I think it comes back to the E is equal to O uh, uh, equation but yeah we're looking for an answer. okay yeah. so people who sell cars when you go onto the lot and you look at cars they, at least here in the US, they call those folks who waste their time and aren't really gonna buy anything, they call them tire kickers, right? They're looking at every car and they're wasting a lot of the salesperson's time. And the salesperson, after a while, understands they're not going to make a sale. This is a low, low opportunity. And the truth is that you have to put less effort into the places where there's less opportunity. You can call this out. You can say to your buyer something like, okay, this is the eighth meeting, and I so appreciate all the questions that you've been asking me. Help me understand your decision process. How close are you? What's it gonna take for you to, to make this decision and move forward? Yeah, you have to call them out. You have to be assertive in this way to understand where they are and why they're doing what they're doing. The truth is some people are lonely. <laughs> they're looking for someone nice to talk to. Some people are just trying to get a better price, not because they want to buy your product, but because they want to use it as leverage with someone else that they already do business with. So we can ask those questions once we have a relationship and once we've listened to their needs, we can make sure that this is a viable potential sale before we invest more time into it. Thanks a lot for that, Deb. And we've got another really interesting question by William Chapman. Uh, he says, how do we really convey the benefit of CRM to sales reps? Because most often they look at it 
uh, you know, as a data monitoring or an administration tool. Uh, do you want to take this? Let me take a short piece of it from sales coaching, and then I know you've got some additional things that, that you could add. Um, in sales coaching, I see this a lot, and I hear this question from sales managers quite often. Here's the problem. If salespeople don't see value in the CRM, they're not going to use the CRM. If you're only using it to evaluate their performance and to collect data, but it's not helping them to make more sales, they're not going to buy into it. So you've got to help them see it as a strategic tool, and that's going to take some coaching. It's going to take teaching them the features, and yes, some expectations so that they'll first put the information in there. Um, but the value, no different than the buyers you work with. It's got to be there. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, in addition to that, usually uh, not all CRMs are created equal. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, a lot of CRMs are out there as data collecting machines, but they actually give uh, very less value back to the user. So it also comes down to choosing the right CRM that's easy to use, that makes inputting the data easily, and at the same time helps the, sa helps the sales reps in their day-to-day -day productivity. Now let's say you know, you're using an Excel sheet and you have 100 customers. It's very hard to keep track of who are you interacting with, you know, what uh, you know, document the conversations you had with anybody. So CRM, that's where CRM comes in. It helps you streamline your entire process, gets all the information in one place so that you don't have to look for the contact information and the interactions you had across multiple different tools, ultimately wasting your time. So uh, you know, I so I think we should just about exploring the different CRMs and figuring out the right fit. Shiva, I see one more question here that I want to answer, and I know we're a little bit past time, uh, but someone has asked, we sell a very technical solution or service, and how do you present technical information without coming across with pride? I think it's a great question, because when you know a lot, it's easy to do an information dump and, and to put it all out there at once. The way you do this is by segmenting it. You give a little information at a time, and then you check for understanding. You say something like, this feature does X, Y, Z. What do you think of that? And you make it a two-way dialogue instead of it just being one direction. The, the key ingredient here is that it be a two-way dialogue, and the only way that happens is if you ask questions along the way. Okay. Deb, I think you've got, like, we've got at least, uh, yeah, we've got quite a few questions. Uh, do you want to uh, take this one up? Uh, how do you deal with customers who are, who are already using the competitor service? Uh, the competitor's service, and let's say they're on contract. We'll make this really juicy and difficult. So they're already on contract. They're already using the competitor service. How do you work with them? You build a relationship. You plant the seeds early. You start to um, make sure that they see more value and service in doing business with you. You see, what happens almost naturally is that once the business is secured and the contract is signed, most sellers, unfortunately, move on. They spend their time with the customers who are newer or the ones who have the bigger complaints. That means that, that most customers tend to feel neglected. And this sweet spot here is about halfway through the contract. If the contract is a year long, the place where customers start to feel neglected is about the six-month mark because the opening activity has waned and nobody is gearing back up for the renewal yet. So if you are there, listening, seeking to understand, asking thought-provoking questions, creating value, not trying to close the sale yet, but establishing the trust in the relationship, you're gonna have a much better shot when it's time for that contract to be renewed because you've had the human-to-human -human connection that counts for a lot. Okay. And then we've got a very good question on diamonds. I think you'll be interested in this. So what is what uh, Johanna, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, is saying is that he is in the business of selling diamonds. And usually when buyers come to him, they have a, a ton of questions regarding the quality, the cut, uh, and the price, the style and budget. So his main question is, how, how can you handle this? Uh, you know, Because you have a lot more information than the customer. How do you handle this? without coming across as very proud. Yeah. Um, here again, we have to make this as interactive as possible. So maybe you're showing the different cuts of diamonds and, and you might point them out. And before you talk about them anymore, you just say, 
which one grabs your attention? Oh, that one, that's, a, that's an opal. Let me tell you a little bit more about the opal. Anything else that you see here that you'd like to learn more about? Now let's talk about clarity. Take a look under this microscope. What do you see? Now look under this one. What do you see that's different? You're making this as much about a memorable experience for them, a two-way dialogue, but you're also getting them involved. You're getting their reactions. You're getting their perceptions. You're getting them to think. That's called getting buy-in. They're buying in before you ever ask them to buy. They buy in to doing business with you. They're creating what they want. They're learning what they want. They're understanding. And those are micro commitments that they're making every step of the way. So yes, you have to teach them and tell them, but you can do that in a different way by facilitating the conversation like a really good trainer would do. Well, uh, do you want to take a couple more questions or should we wrap up? Uh, let's do one more. Okay. Uh, let me just scroll through it once and then... Uh, Okay, so uh, so so one of the questions by the way is, uh, you know, if if a customer wants to buy primarily on price, you know, all when he's evaluating vendors, all of them stack up, but price is the deciding factor. But if he were to reduce the price, he would take a hit on his margin levels. So how do you convince the customer to to buy uh, to, to not just focus on the price and everything else is equal? among the competition. Okay. So actually, a price-only buyer is more rare than you might think. Everybody starts with price, and everybody uses the objection of your price is too high because that's the one that does the very best job of making sellers go away. But when it gets right down to it, this is according to buyer side research, far fewer buyers are truly price-driven alone. There are always other things, other types of value that supersede price, almost always. But when you come across one who you are certain is price focused only, you'll want to make sure that you break the price down. If there are going to be with the uh, competitor they're considering, if there are going to be malfunctions, earlier replacements, higher service charges, something else, then you talk about the, the price in those terms and you break it down. And if it still is less expensive to do uh, something with a competitor, then by now, if you haven't got the relationship that supersedes the price, you might have to walk away from that buyer. And it might be a good thing to walk away from a truly price-only buyer anyway, because you can never win. If you ever have a price increase, if anybody else undercuts you, if there's anything at all that causes price to seem lower somewhere else, you're going to lose that buyer anyway. So it's a low value buyer if it truly is a price only buyer, which I'm going to say it probably isn't. Great questions. I hope people will connect with me and we can keep the conversation going offline. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Deb. Thanks a lot, guys, for logging in today. Again, if you, you can try a retag for free. If you have any questions, you can write to me or Deb. We'll share all the contact details to all the registration registra registrants or an email. Uh, and at the same time, we're also conducting a webinar in the, in the coming months. So, you know, we are going to be calling experts just like Deb to impart these, these, these insights. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and you can connect with us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on, and, and follow us on Twitter. And let me know if you have any further questions. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye-bye.